Hello. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to talk about integrals, which are also known as antiderivatives, which is a clue about how to do them. But um, it's another kind of operation in calculus, a fundamental operation in calculus, um, which is going to be necessary for us to do physics. And I want to talk about the interpretation of integration, what it is, um, and also functionally how you do it. So let me start by having you recall the definition of the derivative. So the derivative of a function, here the function is x. The derivative of x is this expression, a limit as delta t goes to zero of the difference in x at two different times divided by that difference in time. <clears throat> this notation I've used here is uh, called prime notation. So I've got x prime of t is what you would say there, and that represents the derivative. So the prime symbol here represents a derivative of x. Um, and we know for physics, what we're talking about here when we take a derivative of x with respect to time is the velocity as a function of time. And that's how we talked about it last time. But it's equivalent a notation to say that x prime of t is the derivative of x, which is the same thing as the velocity of t uh, excuse me, the velocity of whatever object we're talking about um, as a function of time. Okay, so that's the definition of the derivative, and we're going to remember that, recall that, need to use it a little bit later. So let's say I have a slightly different situation. Um, what we had last time was we had a position function, and we wanted to figure out what the velocity function was for um, an object. But let's say we know the velocity of an object and want to know its position as a function of time. Um, then we have to think about it a little bit differently. So I've sketched this graph here. So I've got this graph of velocity versus time. More or less, it's an arbitrary velocity graph. Uh, I've just sketched something. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. Um, and if I wanted to figure out position, well, I can approach that kind of like this. So let's say I wanted to know how far something had traveled. So the displacement of an object between two times. So let's say it's this time. Let's say this is time equals A. And over here, maybe this is time equals B. And I want to know what's the displacement of the object between A and B. Um, there are ways to approximate the displacement. So if I want to know what's the displacement, what's delta X? between A and B? That's the question I'm trying to answer. Um, I know something. So I know, for example, um, by definition, the average velocity between two points is the displacement over the time interval. So if I knew the average velocity, um, I could just take the average velocity times delta t, and that would be the displacement. Um, but there's not necessarily an easy way to find the average velocity here. However, I can approximate the average velocity. So let's say that I break the, uh, the time from A to B up into little time steps. So let's say I break it up into small time steps. So I do something like this. So I break it up into little time steps. And I say that there's a little delta t here, and it's the same delta t here, hopefully that's intelligible, and so on. And I keep breaking this up into little time steps all the way from A to B. And maybe I call A time one, I would call the next one time two, time three, and so on until I get, until I get to B. So I divide the space or the time from A to B up into a bunch of little time steps. And then what I do is I say, okay, let me take the velocity at the beginning of the time. So let me take this velocity, which is the velocity at t1. And then to approximate the displacement from t1 to t2, I can say that the displacement from t1 to t2, so I'll call that delta x um, 1, 2, let's say, that's approximately equal to v at t1 times delta t. Uh, 
because I'm approximating the value of the velocity at that initial time as uh, the average velocity. And I'm multiplying now my approximate average velocity times the time step, and I get a displacement. Um, what I have done effectively is I've taken a tiny little rectangle. I've taken, taken a rectangle that looks like this in purple here on the graph. I've taken the area of that rectangle. So this represents the area of the purple rectangle. And um, if I wanted to keep going with this approximation, I would do the same thing for every other little rectangle that I have. Um, and so I would really end up with a sum. So the total displacement from A to B would be something like a sum of V at T at all my different T sub whatevers, so I'll call that TI, times delta T, where I goes from one to N, and let's say N is the total number of steps, time steps I have from A to B. So this is the approximate area um, under the curve. So there's, um, so interpretively, what delta X represents here is the sum of a bunch of rectangles. Um, and those rectangles don't exactly represent the area they're meant to represent, but they're pretty close. And as, as delta T goes to zero and N goes to infinity, this approximation gets uh, good. This approximation improves um, and becomes exact um, in the limit. It becomes exact when um, we have a limit of uh, delta t going to zero. So interpretively, what that means is you take this little rectangle and you shrink delta t so that the rectangle starts to look more like this. And you can see that as you shrink the rectangle um, in time, the value of the velocity at t1 gets closer to being actually the velocity at the entire time interval. So if I eventually shrink the rectangle so much that it's basically just infinitely thin right here at t1, then the velocity at t1 does represent the velocity for the entire infinitely small time interval. And so I get an exact uh, uh, calculation for the area under the curve for that tiny, tiny sliver of area. And then I have an infinite number of those little rectangles that I'm adding up. Um, that limit is what we call an integral. So that sum transitions into something we call an integral where what we're doing is we're adding up an infinite number of infinitely small boxes or rectangles. And notationally, what that looks at like is the displacement is equal to, now equal to, not approximately equal to, the integral from A to B, starting at A, going to B, of the velocity as a function of time, dt. So um, a couple of things. This dt now represents um, like uh, delta t as delta t goes to zero. So dt represents an infinitesimally small amount of time. dt is one thing. d and t are not separate in this. dt is just a single number, which is infinite, infinitesimally small. Um, it's called the differential of t. Um, so this is called, uh, I'm going to do some labeling too. So this is called the differential of t. And it's equivalent to delta t in that Riemann sum expression we had before. Differential of t. And this tells us that um, we're moving along time when we're doing this sum. Um, tells us that we're moving along time. Tells us that time is changing as we do this operation. Okay, um, this thing 
is uh, the velocity as a function of time. So the velocity of a function as a function of time changes as time changes here too. But now instead of changing discreetly like it was up here, um, because we had these like distinct discrete time steps, it's now changing continuously because we shrunk our time steps down to zero. So we have this continuously changing function here. Um, this thing, just nomenclature wise, this is called the integrand. That's the thing that's, uh, we would say that's the thing we're integrating. Um, this thing is where we start. So we're asking for the displacement between time equals A and time equals B. This is, um, so where, this is when time starts. Um, it's called the lower bound. Lower bound of the integral. And this is when time ends or when the time end that we're considering. Um, when time ends for the integral, and it's called the upper bound. Okay, so we've got a lower bound and an upper bound that tells us where our integral starts and stops. We've got an integrand that tells us, whoops, what happened? There we go. We've got an integrand that tells us what the function is that we're integrating. And we've got the differential of t that tells us what is the variable we're integrating over. So the dt is really important here, um, even though it doesn't necessarily factor into the calculation, as we'll see in a bit. Um, but it's really important to have to keep track of what is the thing that's changing in this integral. In this case, it's time. OK. Um, so that's all fine. Notation is a little bit new and confusing, but that's OK, too. Um, but how do you actually solve a problem like this? We just have this thing, um, and it's this, this new relationship between uh, position or displacement and velocity. Well, we solve it kind of with a trick, and this is where um, the antiderivative idea comes in. So I'm going to write this a slightly different way. So I can, I can write this integral expression a little bit differently. So I can say delta x. So that is the position at B minus the position at A is equal to the integral of the velocity, but the velocity is the same thing as X prime of T, the derivative of T, DT. Okay, why is that important or why is that useful? Because if I know that the function inside the integral, the integrand, if I know that's a derivative, I can just take the derivative in reverse and get the function that's supposed to go here and here. What do I mean by that? So recall the problem we did last time. So the problem we did last time was if I have a function of x that is equal to 4t squared plus 2, I think it was, um, 4t squared plus 2 then we figured out that the derivative of that function, x prime of t, which is v of t, was equal to 8t. So here's an example of how you can use this expression above, this, this um, integral expression, to go from velocity to displacement. So let's say I now have a velocity function that is 8t. Let's say I just use this exact same function. So I have uh, velocity function, so v of t, t, and my velocity function is 8t. So maybe it looks like this, it's just a straight line. Um, now I want to know what's the displacement uh, over a certain time. So let's say I want to know the displacement from t equals 1 to t equals uh, 4. Three, four. So it looks about right. Okay, so what's the displacement um, from t equals one to t equals four? Well, I would set up an integral. So I would say the displacement, um, that is the position at four minus the position at one, which is the same thing as the displacement, is equal to the integral of the velocity dt, we argued that that was how we should set it up, 
And the lower bound here is one, because the, the time, first time I'm considering is one, and the upper bound is four. But I also know the function. So let me plug that in. So delta x equals integral from one to four of eight t dt. Um, but I know that this thing, eight t, represents the derivative of the function that I want here. So the function that I want here is actually just this working in reverse. If I know the rule to go from this to this, if I want to go from this backwards, I just do the problem in reverse here. I'm doing an antiderivative. I'm undoing the derivative. Except that there's one important caveat, which is that this thing, this plus two, never factors into this derivative. And in fact, if this is the derivative, which represents the slope of the position, then this slope could correspond to any number here. Like I can shift my function up and down as much as I want without changing the slope at all. And so what happens when I do um, the antiderivative here, the way I write this is I say, okay, the antiderivative of 8t is 4t squared. plus c. And c represents an arbitrary constant, which essentially means that like, when I, t when I go from here back to here, I don't really know what this is. Could be anything. Um, but there's, uh, it kind of comes out in the wash. So notationally, here's another thing we do. We're really taking a displacement. Um, what I have here is a function. So how do I get from a function to a displacement? Well, I say, I take that function, but evaluate it at one and four. So I keep the lower and upper bounds. And then I say delta x is um, x at four. So that is four times four squared plus c minus uh, x at one, which is four one squared plus c. And the c's cancel out here. So for the purposes of the displacement, it doesn't matter. And if I do some math in my head, uh, four cubed is 16, or excuse me, four cubed is 64, minus four is 60. So that's 60. I didn't give units, probably meters or centimeters or something like that, but I'll just leave it unitless. Um, that's the displacement from time equals one to time equals four. The key was doing this antiderivative. That is going from um, a, the derivative of a function to be able, being able to predict what that function must look like on the basis of its derivative. It's thinking backwards. But if you know the rules for taking a derivative, in general, you know the rules for taking an antiderivative too. You just apply the rules for derivation in reverse. Um, so I'll put some problems up for you to work on. Um, there's a lot in this video interpretively, problem solving wise. Um, there's much more to understand here. And as you do more problems, you get more comfortable with it. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions and um, I'll see you all soon. Bye.